Um, so, on so this question is for Maria. When all of this sounds great in a bubble, but the reality is that we live in New York City. A lot of us are always on the go, and we don't necessarily get to think about you know a lot of these amazing foods for immunity. And you know you're just stuck in a decision. How do you, on one hand, sort of prep and do things to make sure that you have what you need, but also what do you do when you're just stuck somewhere in a public area and you just have to eat something? I think preparation is key in healthy eating. And the more prepared you are, the better it's gonna be. Because if you don't have any ingredients at home or you don't know where you're gonna go to lunch and you're starving, chances are you're not gonna have the best options or make the best choices. So I really, and my clients have found a lot of success in doing batch cooking, which is essentially planning out your meals for the week, spending a couple hours on a Sunday, preparing things. You could either make the full meals and just have to reheat during the week, or you can make a few vegetables, a few different proteins, some dressings, and basically mix and match throughout the week. And I think that's really helpful. When you're out and about, so, you know, I think uh, you had also asked like about like when you're at a train station or an airport and things like that, where there are not really a lot of healthy options. Uh, again, so preparing and knowing, okay, if I'm going somewhere where there's not going to be any healthy options, maybe I should you know take 10 minutes to stop somewhere and pick something up on the way. Uh, number one. Uh, number two is you know choosing the lesser evil, right? Um, I think we can always make the best decision in, in the moment. You don't have to be perfect all the time. Our body is a result of what we do most of the time, not once in a while. So I think that as long as we're sticking to foods in their real or whole form as much as possible, that's really what you want to look for uh, when you're out. So checking the ingredient lists, making sure there's not a ton of sugar in there, making sure all of the ingredients ideally you can understand, uh, there are ingredients you would use your own kitchen. Uh, these are going to be foods that you want to go towards and you want to kind of avoid the processed stuff. Uh, and in particular, because I know you had asked me about the airport thing earlier, you know, it's not a terrible thing to fast. And so sometimes, and intermittent fasting um, is, I think it's becoming more popular and people are finding a lot of benefits from doing it. And so for example, when traveling, if I have a short flight, uh, that's three hours and get into the airport, I might just pass for five, six, seven, eight, 12 hours, whatever it is, and, and I'm fine. And the reason that I'm able to do that, I think uh, you know, sometimes people you know, joke about being hangry, right? So hungry that you're angry. And that's usually gonna happen when your blood sugar is not balanced, when you're eating processed foods, when you're having cereal or toast for breakfast, uh, or a cookie or snack, and your blood sugar is on this roller coaster of up and downs, that's really when that hangriness is gonna uh, come. If you're eating well-balanced meals at every meal that has your vegetables, your protein, your fat, you're not gonna feel that way. Your, your blood sugar is gonna be balanced and you should be able to go for long periods of time without feeling hungry or moody or any of that stuff. So I would say that's, that's definitely a, a viable option. I will add yes. something to that. Uh, the, well, there's a lot of benefits to fasting, but there's a lot of different ways to fast. And it's, uh, one of the ways is to mimic fasting where you fool your body into thinking that it's fasting, uh, but you're not in a complete fast. So a way to do this would be to eat something that's not going to have any sort of impact on your blood sugar. So for example, nuts while you're traveling. So you can have a handful of nuts Make sure you're hydrating because when you're on a flight, you're losing a lot more fluid than you realize. The air is really, really dry, and every time you breathe out, you're breathing out a lot of moisture out of your body. Uh, but by doing that, actually, when you do this for a couple of days, in fact, it turns on something in the body. It turns on longevity genes, and it also turns on something in the cells called autophagy which is basically eating self, but it's breaking down old proteins and getting rid of debris that is not needed anymore. And that's a process that can happen when you do something like fast or fast mimicking where you're eating really uh, low calories, you're not completely fasting, uh, but you're keeping your blood sugar even by only eating fat and vegetables and maybe some protein, some small amount of protein. So there's ways to make it through and actually a really good excuse to do that when you're traveling 
but if I find myself in a bind at an airport, I always go for nuts or seeds. And of course, have to be really careful about, I, I honestly like to bring stuff with me because a lot of these nuts that you buy at the airport have some sort of omega-6 oil that they add to them, like so, um, sunflower or soybean oil, and I honestly don't want to consume that. So nuts is just something so easy to just pour with you. So you always have a backup when you're on the go. Yes, I'm guilty of bringing nuts now with me everywhere. The more I've learned about a lot of the oils that they add to conventionally made nuts, which I didn't know before. Um, do you have any tips for when you're kind of in a bind or on the go or an airport? What do you, how do you make choices to keep yourself well? Um, you know, it's funny. Conveniently, uh, most of my solutions have already been said, but I think for me, the, the big things are reading the back of the label and making sure that it's made from as whole ingredients as possible. And really trying to recognize and understand that there's no additional additives. Um, and then nuts, actually, is, is something that was told to me uh, really early on, and that's been sort of a staple. And then I find also, because flying is so dehydrating, um, drinking as much water as I can is pretty safe. It can be satiating if you drink enough of it. Yeah. So that's those are my general, um, my general like hacks. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch gears for a second and ask about like, actual natural medicines and things that you might take if you actually were sick. I feel like that's part of eating too. But mm -hmm. whether it's you know teas or different herbs, um, if there's any sort of protocol that you go into when you feel a, a cold coming, what would it be? I'm starting with me. Yes, I'm starting with me. <laughs> if I if I feel like I have a sore throat. I, I actually like to have a shot of ginger, maybe with some cayenne. Like I can, I can take the spice, but ginger is antimicrobial. So when it passes through your throat, it's gonna start killing off whatever it is that's invading. I also use herbal sprays that I have that have a lot of different antimicrobial herbs. But even oregano oil is really great. Uh, it has both antiviral, antibacterial, and even antiparasitic properties. Uh, but even just on the standard end, uh, if I'm coming down with a cold or a flu, I take a mega dose of vitamin D. So everybody talks about vitamin C, but vitamin C isn't really that proven to prevent colds. Uh, but I find that vitamin D is a mega dose. What it does is it communicates at the nuclear level so it's turning on genes in your body, and one of the genes that it turns on encodes for antimicrobial peptides. So it's part of our very primitive immune system. So it doesn't have to be as specific as antibodies. So the reason that it takes a while to get over a cold sometimes is your body has to go through the process of developing an antibody to the invader, and that process has to go, it's almost like they're building a blueprint. And your body then has to go and create the antibody molecules. But the difference with the innate immune system that is activated by vitamin D is that it releases these antimicrobial peptides that have evolved from the very beginning of time, and they can go in and poke holes in whoever the invader is and destroy it. So very high dose of vitamin D. Um, I go pretty high, like 50,000 units. The regular uh, recommended dose is about 1,000 units a day. I've never had any adverse reaction from taking this mega dose um, and actually have gotten over the flu in 24 hours by doing that. The other thing is elderberry. Elderberry is really good, uh, proven in studies to reduce the duration of the flu by up to three or four days. And that's better than any medication out there. So elderberry syrup, uh, pretty great high dose, like every four hours, 15 mLs, which is about half an ounce. And um, those are kind of like my, my magic remedies for cutting a, a cold early on, along with making my immune boosting soup with mushrooms. Where, where do you get the mega dose? Sorry. No, no, no. Where do you get the mega dose? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, you could get a 5,000 D3 and then just take 10 of them. Which is like a normal sort of... Vitamin, as long as vitamin, you want to get vitamin D3, 
which is pretty much what is on the market now. Before, there used to be D2, which really doesn't get well absorbed through the gut lining, so it, most of it is wasted. Uh, but as long as the D3 and just add up, I mean, you're not going to want to get 1,000 unit pills, you're going to have to take 50 of them. Right. But 5,000. Are the brands that. that you find more effective? Than Some of the brands that I work with are nutraceutical companies that I know like produce uh, supplements at, at a very high grade. So, for example, companies like orthomolecular products, pure encapsulations, corn, uh, metagenics. So companies that I know are, are doing their due diligence in making sure that the substrates they're using to make their supplements are of the highest grade possible. So don't walk into a place like GNC right. and, or buy something that's generic and or that, uh, I don't know, a pharmacy has slapped their label on and think that it's going to be a good quality supplement. So you have to do your due diligence on the company and, and there's a website actually, consumerlab.com, that reviews a lot of these supplements and sees, because sometimes, and you have to be really careful about what you buy out there because there are now companies swapping labels so you think you're buying the high grade supplement but it's actually been switched. And sometimes a clue might be that the supplement arrives with a stick on that has a different expiration date because they never put a stick on sticker with the expiration date. It's always printed into the bottle. So if you see something like that, that's a sign that it's actually a fraud, that it's not a, a it's not really from the company. And there's some companies that are doing that, they're creating knockoffs and then selling them on Amazon. So it, it gets a little complicated. And if anyone who's a patient in my practice knows that I, I have a portal where I prescribe supplements and I know they're coming from the actual company, that they're not coming from some other place. I definitely just ordered vitamins on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question about supplements. Do you recommend taking those on a regular basis? You mentioned hyperdose, which you get sick, but obviously you want to prevent that in the first place. It seems like most things that are naturally rich in vitamin D are like fish or salmon, sardines, or uh, matsutake mushrooms. They have the highest amount of vitamin D in a, in a non uh, animal source, but I honestly I always start with diet first Like eat your vitamins and antioxidants get it through a diet that is rich in All sorts of vegetables across the spectrum So don't be monochromatic and eat just greens and think you're being healthy like eat greens reds blues purples yellows oranges like you need to get the spectrum of colors because in those colors are represented all the different nutrients that the body needs. And then I'm, I'm very much into selective supplementation based on deficiencies. Now, if you're someone that does not eat their vegetables, then maybe a multivitamin is a good idea, but I'm more a proponent of eating your vitamins through the foods that you select. So if you like plant-based diet, what other things other than mushrooms would you recommend? I was just doing some research, and I didn't see much beyond mushrooms. So if, you're, if you have a plant-based diet, then you may be deficient in vitamin B12, because uh, most B12 comes from animal, from red meat. And the highest concentration of B12 is in liver. So a lot of people who are vegetarian or vegan may be deficient in vitamin B12. It's not necessarily gonna affect your immunity, but it can affect your your energy levels. So my, yeah, and, and the, well, yeah. I mean, if you're Down severely, if you're severely vitamin B12 deficient, you can develop a problem with your balance centers and your proprioception. Uh, but the other thing would be iron, because you could be deficient in iron if you're not, if if you're not food combining the right way. So if you're vegetarian, you need to make sure that you're getting non-meat sources of iron, or even cooking on a cast iron uh, pot or skillet, so that the iron from the, the skillet can get into the vegetables that you're eating. You may have some other ideas on that. Spirulina, um, too. Well, I, I think B12, yeah, B12 is the big one, iron. Um, and with B12, it's better to take the spray sublingually uh, than, than a pill. It's just absorbed better. Um, but yeah, those are the big ones for vegetarian or vegan. So Maria, while I have you talking, um, some specific dishes that some people can try for community-boosting foods at home this winter? 
Well, definitely a lot of soups and, and broths and bone broths. I think those are really healing. If you're already sick, um, so like Dr. Pedre said, um, vitamin C, I think it's very common. Like everyone thinks like, oh, I'm sick, like there's a mega dose on vitamin C, but it hasn't really been shown to uh, be very effective. Uh, but the elderberry is great. Um, zinc, again, zinc-rich foods. Uh, zinc has been shown, um, you know, taking zinc supplementation, which you can get in lozenge and all sorts of tinctures and things. That has been shown to reduce the number of days that you're sick and the severity of your sickness, just like elderberry. Um, and so, yeah, I would just say a lot of warming foods, a lot of the garlic and ginger, turmeric, uh, onions, those, like using them to start the base of a soup would be a really great thing. And then all of your colors, your oranges, your greens, your blues, making sure you're getting a variety of those vegetables. And I want to circle some back to something that uh, you said about intention, uh, because an important part of eating is, is our own intuitiveness about what your body needs. And a lot of us really don't pay attention to that intuition. Like if you feel your body is asking for ginger, then maybe you need ginger. Or if you feel that your body needs some turmeric or that you need a soup, or maybe you don't want a soup, maybe you need something else. Like listen to the intuitiveness of your body telling you what it is that you need to nourish yourself because there's there's always truth behind that. And that's really important and I love that uh, you make your food with intention. What what if your body's telling you to eat french fries? <laughs> no, that's a serious question. Like, what if your body's craving yeah. foods that are high in sugar? So maybe you are low in salt. Is that, no, you know, so that's maybe, a serious question. Like, have, what, 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 what do you recommend when you have these cravings that you need to satisfy that are sugary or... Usually if cravings, like sugar cravings are coming, yeah. it's because the whole makeup of the diet is around uh, fueling around uh, simple starches. So if you change the way that you eat, then you're not gonna crave those foods because your body doesn't need them to run energy. So our energy centers, the mitochondria, can run on two energy sources. And one of them is glucose, which is sugar, and that comes from cane, for anything from cane sugar to french fries, mm -hmm. which are basically just long glucose molecules, one end to end, hundreds of them. And then your body can run on fats on ketones mm -hmm. and so you can switch between the two and that's a survival mechanism because back in the day when food was not always available our bodies needed to be able to switch to a different energy source when we didn't have carbohydrates so that we could go hunting or get our food but if you are uh, what we call metabolically flexible by eating a diet that's not too high in sugar and starches then you're not going to crave them in that sense, like right. the type of craving that you're talking about, right. where it's like you're not in control, it's like the food is in control. Yeah. And it could be that your gut bacteria are in control because that's what you're feeding your body, and by doing so, then you create an environment of bacteria and possibly yeast overgrowth that then sends signals to your brain telling you that you want more of this. And you think that your brain is actually thinking, but it's your gut right. that's telling you. No, I always find that when, when you're avoiding foods that are high in sugar and very refined carbohydrates, and you start eating without it, that you don't even miss it at a certain point, which I guess has a pretty biological... You may even find that if, when you have it, that the sugar rush is too potent. Right. Like right. You're, you almost feel agitated. And that's again from really tuning into your inner state, like understanding your body and what's good for your body. Because right. I, I do believe there's an intuitiveness in all of us to know that that French fry is not necessarily the best thing. Sure. So having that craving is a signal that you're already out of a certain balance. That it needs, it's a bigger sort of long yeah. term thing. You have to look at right. what is the. Uh, what is the milieu of your diet? Right. What's what's the overall diet that you're having and has, has it kind of flipped the balance to running too much on sugar and mm -hmm. simple starches, you know, which are gonna also inhibit your immune system. Because the other thing I didn't say is sugar feeds cancer. You know, so it's not just about our immune system. One of the things that it does is it surveys the body for cancerous cells and gets rid of them.
and sugar is the most powerful fuel for cancer. One thing I'll just add to that, um, so sometimes when we're creating like greasy fatty foods, um, it can actually be a sign of an omega-3 deficiency. Mm. And so omega-3 is primarily found in seafood and some plant foods like walnuts and chia seeds, but it's not really found in a lot of foods. So um, it is can be a relatively common uh, deficiency.